Hello everyone, I am Cheryl Crooks, Executive Director of Cascadia International Women's Film Festival. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to an interview with the director of Monkey Beach, Loretta Todd. But before we get to that, I'd like to first thank the sponsors of this year's festival. The major media sponsor, KCTS, Crosscut Magazine, the Mary Redmond Foundation, and the Washington State Arts Commission, as well as all of our other sponsors, without whom this festival would not have been possible. Today's interview with Loretta was being conducted by Lynn Dennis, who is a member of the Cascadia Board of Directors, a filmmaker, and also a member of Lummi Nation. She'll be talking with Loretta about how she made the film, some of the process she used, and what she does to prepare for a shoot like she did on Monkey Beach. I'd also like to thank the sponsors for this particular film, John Bletham of New Whatcom Interiors and Bellingham's Unitarian Fellowships Social and Environmental Justice Committee. Thank you all so much for joining us for this discussion. I know you're going to enjoy it. Well, hi there, Loretta. Uh, we so appreciate you being available uh, for this interview today for our exciting Cascadia International Women's Film Festival that is coming up. And, and uh, I would like to know uh, uh, what tribe you're from and uh, talk a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah, it was so wonderful to meet you. So my family um, is Niawa, which is a Cree way of saying it, uh, Cree, <laughs> um, but it's usually termed Cree, and also Métis, um, Métis being the nation, this sort of, sep you know, this new nation, if you like, in, in Canada. My family um, from Whitefish Lake First Nation, St. Paul de Métis, and one of the original uh, Red River Métis Nation. And also we have relatives um, two generations, two generations ago, three generations ago in um, Turtle Mountain, um, Chippewa, which I'd like to explore. My great grandmother married somebody from, from Turtle Mountain. So one day I'd like to reach out and offer my services to, to Turtle Mountain one day, you know, just as a way of giving back uh, from my grandfather, great grandfather is a uh, meeting of my great grandmother, <laughs> which resulted in my grandmother, which resulted in my father, which resulted in me. So one day, but yeah, so there's a broad range of uh, uh, indigeneity in my, in my family. Now, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, do you consider yourself a trailblazer? Well, you know, it's funny, you know, lately the words, you get these words, sort of the good side of that word, and then the other side of the word. So I get veteran sometimes, and I get, you know, um, trailblazer. Um, lately, I've been I've been liking the word front runner, not because I'm front and I'm better, but I like this idea because we used to have runners. You know, many of our nations had runners, and the, those runners would run from one nation to or one camp to another or one village to another, and they'd bring news or they'd bring stories or they'd bring something that you know was needed. And so I like to think of it that way. Lately, I've been thinking about as a runner, as a front runner. Trailblazer, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I but I, I never set out to do that. It wasn't something intentional. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to change everything. It's like, no, I'm just here in service to storytelling, you know, to um, creating space for stories, telling stories. And I guess because I was in this weird confluence of events as far as time, um, that kind of put me in what some people would call a trailblazer, but it wasn't something I set out to do. Loretta, if I may call you that, uh, as a film producer and director, in terms of your journey and getting to where you're at today, what has that involved? Well, you know, I would probably never was meant to be a filmmaker in many ways. You know, my life took many of those sort of strange twists and turns for many of our people. Um, you know, nothing's kind of like set out, you know, in a simple way. I was a runaway at 13 and was a mother at 14. Um, I was lucky that I was embraced by, I moved from Alberta to, to Vancouver. I was lucky I was embraced by the indigenous community, urban native community in Vancouver, because I, maybe I wouldn't have survived otherwise. Um, so I was lucky to um, you know, go volunteer at the local friendship center, and at that friendship center, met people like the late Chief, uh, Chief Leonard George. Chief Dan George wasn't alive then, but 
you know, Leonard George, who was the son of the late Chief Dan George, um, and, you know, very kind and um, inclusive people, people who, who, who believed in, you know, all of our people, all of our people being together in a circle. So that was really helpful because it hasn't been an easy journey. Certainly, um, it meant that I had to, you know, find a way to support my daughter. And that went everywhere from working in a bakery to doing construction, working as a waitress, um, housekeeper, you know, babysit, whatever I could do to support my daughter um, and me. And so um, eventually, for some reason, I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. It wasn't something that it was uh, an easy decision and it wasn't something like, oh, uh, you know, you, you feel kind of humble about it because you think, you know, oh, well, you know, who, who said you could be a filmmaker? Who said you could do this? But a couple of things I think were important to me in that process is coming from one territory into somebody else's territory. I was very conscious that I wasn't in my territory. I was in the territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam people who have lived in Vancouver since time immemorial. And they have been leaders in so many ways and they have taught me so many things. So how can I still have my artistry, have my voice and um, be, you know, recognize that I'm not in someone, I'm not in my territory. So for me being a filmmaker is sort of a way of doing that because I'm behind the camera, I'm in service to the story. I'm there to like, again, create space for others and, and even myself. Um, to tell stories. So that was sort of one of the things that, you know, I, I was looking, how can, how can I be best? How can I help these people, these communities? How can I be in service to this community? I mean, I thought of different things. I thought, oh, maybe one day I could be a lawyer. And I was like, oh, I looked at it and said, oh, it's going to be a lot of work. I don't know. I, I, you know, I mean, I just don't have the kind of academic you know, straight line, you know, kind of thing to make that an easy process. I knew that wasn't going to be an easy process, but I had always been very visual. I had always been inspired by film. I was, you know, those nerdy kids who sat around with their, you know, mom and grand, you know, parents and stuff watching old movies on television rather than being out playing with the kids. So I already had this kind of weird, you know, nerdy, um, interest in film and just storytelling or maybe it was just because I could immerse myself in another world um, but in any case that's sort of part of the journey that got me here I went I was working uh, full-time and because I was a workaholic um, I, I my manager said you know I said I want I, I've been accepted at film school at Simon Fraser and you know but I don't want to quit because I still don't know because you've got to do first year and then you then you have to reapply and just see if you get into second year. So I couldn't really quit my job because I didn't know if I was going to get into second year. So I approached my manager and said, you know, I need to do this and I need to take some time off, like, you know, here and there. And he said, oh, that's okay because you're a workaholic. I know you're going to get your job done anyways. So the first year I worked full time, you know, raising my daughter and going to film school. And fortunately, I guess I was, you know, moderately successful at that so that um, the, I was accepted in the second year and then I was then I quit my job. I still had to work. I had other work here and there, part-time work, whatever I could do to find the way um, to make a living. But that's sort of where the journey, where the journey began. Uh, is there anyone that has inspired you uh, to be a film director? Is there any one person or any one thing that has inspired you? Well, you know, I would have to say, uh, go back to Leonard George, um, because he was so um, kind and, you know, here's this little, who was I, you know, I was, you know, nobody. And he, you know, he did treat everybody like that, like you were like something that was really important in this world. And I think that gave me confidence to think that I could do something special myself. Um, he for sure. Um, and this, you know, was coming about before I went to film school. So I was, you know, working, um, you know, volunteering in the Native community in different ways in Vancouver or part of this organization or that. So I was meeting different people. And another person that really inspired me was a late Doreen Jensen, who's, you know, since passed away. She was a, a Gitsan woman who was in one of my films, A Hands of History. She was um, an artist. She was an artist who always put her family first and struggled with being able to 
express herself as an artist. She was always sort of helping others. And so I was always sort of aware of that, that that seemed to be my pattern too. Um, and, and I always sort of in some ways do work in, in, in tribute to her. Like the more I can create my own art, then in a way I'm giving tribute to her um, for someone who created amazing art um, and, but didn't always get to do all the art that she wanted to. So that was, and I, that's another reason why I try to create space, particularly for Indigenous women, so that, you know, a lot of us don't think we have the ability or the means or, you know, the right even to tell stories. So uh, I think she also really inspired me, but um, I wouldn't say any particular filmmaker. Um, it was really more those community people who were um, there trying to make us to re recognize how powerful we, we are, you know, how in intrinsically powerful we are as, as Indigenous people. Thank you. That, that uh, those two individuals sound like they were very, very special and very inspiring to you. Now, in terms of uh, Monkey Beach, which we are so delighted uh, to uh, have as a part of our festival, uh, what has been your uh, role in the film? And, and first of all, is there a meaning to the title? <laughs> well, the, the, the title comes from the book, Monkey Beach, was written by Eden Robinson, who's, you know, an amazing Heisla Hillsuk writer here in Canada. Um, the Monkey Beach is an actual place. It's a, it's a place where people have been climbing and, you know, from the, from the Heisla village of Kinmat for, for, for centuries, really. Um, and the story goes that when they used to go up there sometimes, the, the bugwas or sasquatches would come down from the mountain and would also uh, do their food gathering. And when that happened, the people would back off and just let them do that thing. And then they would do their food gathering, you know, clamming, whatever, and then go back up the mountain. So um, it was known, so over time, Bugwas Sasquatch got changed to the idiom of monkey. So that's sort of where it comes from. So it's in terms of, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but no, it's okay. It's okay. Of, uh, in terms of uh, what you have uh, been involved with, with this film, uh, we know that you're the director, but I know there's so much more involved in the spectrum. What, what was your, what was your experience with that endeavor? Well, I actually optioned the book way back in the day over 15 years ago I was uh, there weren't any I was doing documentaries I was uh, eventually I did a lot of children's uh, programming that I created and produced um, but I hadn't done a feature film and as indigenous filmmakers we were trying to make them you know we had been I'd been asked by different people to direct their features we'd been knocking on the doors for financers in, in Canada for for a while nothing was kind of clicking. It was sort of now there's a lot of opportunity in Canada to make feature films, but 15 years ago, there wasn't for, well, for indigenous filmmakers or, you know. So um, it was not easy. I optioned the book. I did that, you know, on my own um, with a lawyer, you know, it took a while because, you know, they have agents and the agents want to get the best deal for their, you know, their clients. Mm -hmm. So that took a while. Um, and then once that happened, I formed a partnership with, um, uh, Mi'kmaq um, filmmaker producer Jeff Baer, who um, we were determined to make it an all Indigenous big budget film. Um, and, you know, we, we worked on that for a few years. And then, you know, we had a creative, uh, you know, we sort of had a creative, no, I wouldn't say uh, conflict. It was just that he wanted to bring somebody else on and I wanted to bring somebody else on and, you know, mm -hmm. Um, and it was really sort of, we decided that we would kind of uh, dissolve the partnership. But, you know, I appreciate and value all the work that he had contributed in that time. Um, mm -hmm. And then I was basically took it forward on my own. Again, you know, there weren't many 
feature films, indigenous feature films being made. Um, so I banged on a lot of doors to try to find financing. I was still determined that it couldn't, it, you know, I was told a few times, gee, well, I was told a bunch of things. I was told, oh, well, you know, you're never going to be able to do this. I was told um, all kinds of things. But I knew that at some point I was going to have to just, I was just determined, you know, you know, I, I was just really determined. I, I uh, looked for private financing. I, I went to some of these wealthy billionaires that are giving their money away. <laughs> they didn't give it away to me, um, but I was never deterred. I just kept moving ahead, moving ahead. And um, I guess again, those sort of stars aligned because then Canada decided that it was going to put funding into indigenous feature film funding. So I was then able to apply and you know, was able to finally make, make Monkey Beach. Now, um, well, congratulations on that. And in terms of a budget, can you say what your budget was? Or is that private? Well, you know, it's t difficult in Canada because it's a weird, like a lot of the budget is tax credits. So it's not, you know, and, and then I also, I spent a lot of money because I was determined to make the film in Kitimat in the village where the story was born and the story is set. Um, and that was one of the things I was told, well, don't make it there, you know, it's just going to cost too much money, just make it in Vancouver, you know, and there's some similarities in, in the, the way the land is in Vancouver and the land up in Kinemat, you know, in terms of these coastal mountains and, you know, lots of water, ocean around, but I was determined it had to be made in the village. So um, that cost me a big part of the budget, but the budget was around, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, fi financing, financial support from government and, and, and so on was, you know, in, in the two millions. Well, you know, I was so impressed with, in fact, uh, I watched your film twice. <laughs> and I was so impressed with uh, the beauty and, you know, all the, all the uh, beautiful footage that you have in there, um, where also uh, uh, Native music was incorporated and it was just beautiful. Can you um, uh, talk a little bit more about that, just in terms of the scenery, what the music, what, what was your intent? What was the intent there? Well, you know, in making the film, I had been going up to Kitimat, you know, and, and I'd been in that area, you know, in the past, there's, a, there's quite a few nations that are along that coastal region from the coast to Prince Rupert going inland. And when I made Hands of History with Jermaine Jensen, I was up there in Gitsan territory, which is, you know, up, you know, a few nations over from, from the Heisla, uh, more inland. Mm -hmm. um, so I had been in that territory and I knew how beautiful it was. And I had been to Kitimat when I started making the film and, you know, had gone up to Monkey Beach with Eden Robinson and her now late father um, with their cousin taking us up in the fishing boat. Um, so I, I knew how beautiful the land was and, and you know, in addition to you know, being committed, committed because I wanted to be distribution of wealth, reciprocity, you know, bring the film to the people to, to make the film there. I also knew how beautiful it was, how, how uh, you know, there's the, a lot of it's been logged, but there's still some places that haven't been logged and where we filmed a lot of the, the, the in the woods, in the Monkey Beach woods, which, which weren't filmed at Monkey Beach. Um, you know, there was a, a, a beautiful park outside of the town. But I always knew that the, 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 the forest, the land is, is witness to these stories. It, it, it births many of these stories, but it's also witness to many of these stories. So it was important for me to be there. It was like, a, it was um, because these stories sort of live beyond just the dimensions of feature films and financing and getting broadcasters and getting distributors, they live on another plane. They live on a plane in which there is meant to be healing and nurturing and um, other important elements and the, the land and the trees and the, you know, the mist and the water are all part of that. So I, I, I felt it was important to actually um, include the land and include it in the water and sky and all those things as sort of an integral part of the story as witness. Now, uh, if I if I was to drive to Vancouver, how would I get to that nation? You would have to drive another 19 hours. Wow. <laughs> so you would basically have to go up, you know, north to Prince George and then over from Prince George. 
um, and that's, you know, on a good day, you know, um, so really it's a two day trip and you can fly, you can fly in, a, in, in about an hour um, uh, in a bit. You can take a ferry. Um, it's kind of a convoluted way, but you can go from actually Bellingham, I think, up to it's Rupert, because there's a Bellingham, I think the ferry used to be anyways, that would go up to Haida Gwaii or up to, to the Alaska, you know, to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way, or you can take a number of ferries to, from the Vancouver Island and then over here and then over there, and then eventually would also bring you up to Prince Rupert. Um, you know, we, we did a combination of flying and, and bringing equipment up. Um, you know, I hired as many people as I could from the village as well. And there are people in the village who actually have worked in the film industry. So I was able to bring those people on, on board as well. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good distance. Well, it was great that you were also able to create jobs. And, you know, as a director, I know that, uh, that you look at the, the depth, the perception, um, how the shots are going to look and utilizing lighting. Uh, can you uh, touch on that in terms of uh, what your vision is uh, for this film? My budget was, you know, quite challenging. And um, basically I had a 20 day shoot. I was, had to, way Canada works, I've been able to produce and own all my other projects like Coyote's Crazy Smart Science Show, 100% um, my own company. But in order to make Monkey Beach, I had to partner with these uh, other uh, service providers and they, um, who, you know, because you have to get tax credits and tax credits, you have to get bank loans, it, it's all very complicated. Um, and their experience has mostly been with television and so their experience was basically, well, you know, you just go bang these things out, you know, 20 day shoot and, uh, you know, you can get it done. You know, that means you just do this formulaic shooting, you know, shot, reverse shots, establishing shots, you know, all the kind of the sort of basics. But that's not me. That's never been me. Um, I've always sought a way to tell a story in which the camera becomes, you know, you know, I'm exercising my agency as an Indigenous woman. And the camera is an extension of that a way of expressing that. So it's important for me to think about every shot, you know, every camera move, you know, how am I, is this all going to piece together? Like every filmmaker does this, but, but when you're trying to create something that is working on this sort of spiritual dimension, if you like, or this, you know, you have to really be very careful about how you shoot, you know, the way the camera is used. I can't say I always able to sometimes because of the, the ambitious script and the, uh, 20 day shoot that meant sometimes I was just one take that's all I could get was one take um, maybe two takes other times because of I was working also with non-actors sometimes you know that's where I spent some time you know trying to get the best performance from them um, all they were all were amazing um, so I think you know my work over the years has shown that I love camera movement um, that I love um, the camera feeling not so much a voyeur looking in at us, but the camera sort of part of, you know, um, um, the storytelling. It's sort of, uh, you know, an extension of, of me, but also an extension of the story of, you know, it, it's sort of intimately linked to the story. So I, I you know, I also, I, I've had, um, and it was fast, like, you know, we got word of funding in June and basically we were shooting in September. So it was a very fast turnaround. Otherwise, I would have had to wait another year because the way the it is up there, if you, it, because it rains so much, if we had waited, tried to film in October, November, it would have just poured rain. Um, otherwise, I would have had to wait for the next year. Um, so I thought it was important for me to, you know, uh, for better or worse, I, I, I did it. But um, I was also very conscious from the very beginning when I started making films, how, um, dismissive the industry can be of women filmmakers to begin with. Um, you know, I've, I'd heard so many things where, oh, well, that filmmaker didn't make that film. You know, the cinematographer made it or the editor made it or somebody else made it, you know. And there's never this kind of uh, recognition of the, the woman's voice, the woman's vision, you know, as a director. And it, sometimes it's because they did struggle 
and you know people were more aggressive to kind of you know push their way into their storytelling other times it was you know just because there was a dismissiveness of their storytelling um, so I was always very conscious that from the very beginning in my filmmaking career that it was really important that it come from me and it be articulated for me keeping in mind that I know that there's grandmothers guiding me that there's other forces but in terms of that actual experience of making that film it has to flow from you know my vision because i didn't want someone saying later you know behind, you know whispering oh loretta didn't make that film so in the way that um so i always been over 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 to achieving overdoing it my very first feature documentary I was stood by my cinematographer all the time. I was always, you know, I was storyboarding scenes. I was, it was a documentary and I was still storyboarding scenes. I was, this is, we're going to shoot here, then we shoot. And later on, when I worked with the same cinematographer later, he says, you know, he said, I've never had a director like hang on my shoulder the whole time. And I said, yeah, it's because I had to, because it's not, I thought that, was, that was the job of the director. But he says, well, a lot of documentary filmmakers just go, oh, well, go shoot that, you know? And I was like, oh, well, no, 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 I can't do that. Because then someone will say that you made the film because, you know, I wasn't paying attention because I said that, you know, the kind of expectations or the, the, the uh, you know, it, it's to always look kind of judge, and or at least I thought so. Anyway, so it was really, really important for me to have every scene storyboarded for Monkey Beach as best I could to have everything worked out best I could even before we started to work carefully with my cinematographer who's a lovely person Sterling Bancroft um you know we sometimes you know um you know there was sometimes misunderstandings but I had to persist and I had to insist um and you know I just you know it was just really really important for me and then there was times where you know um I thought well what conveys this moment the best and sometimes it's because I've got a half an hour left of the day because uh, a lot of the crew were union crew because that service providing company is signed on with the union so I had to work with within the unions which is fine I mean it's great that there are unions out there protecting you know film workers too but it also creates some uh, means that that's time the time's up we're in overtime now so with a limited budget you have to be so careful so sometimes you've got half an hour left and you know the scene because of all these other complications you know the lighting didn't work or the crane didn't work or something didn't work you still got to get that scene and so sometimes i had to just adjust on the moment um how am i going to shoot this wide and still make it feel like it isn't um a moment of just well she couldn't get enough coverage obviously she you know she failed as a director so i had to find ways that are very creative in terms of uh, creating those moments even when there's um, you know limited time to be able to to get that shot um, I'm really really proud of a few scenes like for that reason um, there's a scene in which Nathaniel Can and Grace Dove are on the beach you know father and daughter and um, she's sort of bummed out by things and she's just sitting there um, in the dark and smoking a cigarette and he comes into the scene and they have their moment and it's really just two shots it's a wide shot and you know then it's it's just really two shots but um one i really respected them respect them as performers as actors um and you know give them the, the space to do that and give them direction to do that and the opportunity and the confidence and, and their abilities to do that at the same time, knowing where the camera is going to be and how I can create that scene um, with that limited amount of time, you know, um, is really critical so that that performance, that place they're going to inhabit those characters to not give us a false moment, um, you know, it helps if I know what I'm doing, if I know what is going to, how I'm going to make them look the best they can you know, keep them in a safe place. Um, and so those are, you know, some of the moments. I, I like to use this this story um, and how I kind of create my spaces for filmmaking. Uh, when I was at film school, before me, a few years, you know, before I got there, there had been a filmmaker from Quebec who had come to speak to, to the school. And he was um, called Jean-Pierre Lefebvre. And my friend told me this later. He said, when Jean-Pierre Lefebvre came, he talked about how he creates this circle 
and he may not have used the word sacred, but he creates this circle in which cinematographers, the director, the PAs, everybody's equal in that circle. Because if the PA makes a mistake, it's going to affect everybody. If the director makes a mistake, it's mm -hmm. going to affect everybody. So he likes to create this, what he calls this circle. And he did it in his own mini Quebecois way of having, you know, a big gathering before the screening and, you know, having this sort of family come together. And the idea being that who's in the circle, in the middle of the circle, whether it's a documentary feature film, that they're there to protect and create the safe space for, um, you know, for the story. Mm -hmm. Well, that's sort of similar to a teaching in, that I was given um, from our culture, which is this idea that, you know, in the middle, in the circle is the elders and the, and the children. And us adults are around that circle. And we are there to protect the elders and the children so that the elders can impart their knowledge to the children and the children can, you know, be open to that experience and that knowledge. And so that's our job to create the sacred space in which that knowledge can be exchanged, that those stories can be shared in a safe place. And, and so I like to think of when I go into filmmaking, I'm creating a sacred space for the story and the people in the story, and we're all responsible. And I do it the best I can. When I'm working with a native crew, I can say this, I can bring everybody into that space and we understand it and we share it. When I'm working with a mixed crew of indigenous and non-indigenous, some people get it, some people don't. Um, but, you know, I still try to, if I can't literally um, communicate that, you know, to them, I try to do it on an energetic level. So I feel like I'm holding this circle and creating this safe space for my, from the people whose story, you know, or who are telling the story, and in this case, the actors. So, um, for, so for me, um, they need to know that I'm as confident as I can be, that I am there to to create that safe space for them so that they can go into those moments and go into those stories and go into those characters and really bring the truth of those characters out. And I have to be as prepared as I can. I have to have as many, much of my storyboarding, my shot list, all those things worked out before we even show up. So that the day is already set, the day is calm, the crew and the cinematographer know what they have to do. And we just sort of try to move through those things as, as smoothly and as, um, almost like dance um, as best we can and then whenever we have to adjust we adjust but nonetheless that was sort of my intention and I think sometimes it, it really works particularly that scene around the campfire with with Ada Beach and Nathaniel Cannon and the family talking about residential school people have told me that they feel that's one of the most honest scenes they've seen about residential school in films because it's us as indigenous people talking to indigenous people. And we don't have to do the filter of non-indigenous people explaining it to them. It's just our moment, our truth, you know, between one another, you know, as a family. And they really feel, and if it's in the book, it's written, it's, a lot of the scene is from the book um, with some adjustments, um, but it's, to me, that was really important that, 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 and that people told me that uh, it was very heartening. I thought, okay, because that's kind of what I set out to do. Now, um, was there also a focus towards love in this film? <laughs> yeah, yeah well, for sure. Because, you know, you know, I don't have to go into my life history. Um, you know, this, it, 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 we've all had such trauma you know, intergenerational trauma as Indigenous people, as Indigenous women, you know, we've had lots of trauma. And, you know, I, I think about this, I think about, well, how do we portray that? You know, um, how do we bring that truth um, without re-traumatizing, without, you know, re like triggering? I mean, you know, and, and, and I'm not here to critique other particularly Indigenous filmmakers who you know have taken a different approach that that's how they've chosen to do it um but for me i've always thought it was important to find that medicine and so that the story brings some medicine and brings some healing into the into the community and i would say that in the character of lisa lisa is basically this indigenous woman who's on this 
edge of embracing her medicine or not. And if she doesn't embrace her medicine, then she will never be that being and what she's been given these gifts to be. So it's, but it's a difficult thing to embrace your medicine. It's not always easy because for one, colonization tells us that, you know, our medicine's bad or we don't have medicine or whatever. It's, it's always these messages of saying we don't have this power. And, you know, and so it's really important um, in my work, I think I've always sort of sought that. I've always sort of sought this um, place of love and healing and, and, and medicine. So it, it's true. Um, Many people have told me that, that in watching Monkey Beach, that they feel a feeling of healing, they feel love, they feel that the film has thought about them, and especially Indigenous people, the trauma, you know, I've thought about that trauma of people who have lost loved ones to violence, um, people who have lost, um, people who have been, um, you know, missing a murdered woman, you know, there's a kind, you know, and it's not, the book it's not big it's not like this is the book about missing a murdered indigenous woman and girls but it, it it's an experience in the book and it's one of the stories um and so how do i convey that without exploiting it without um and how do i honor that and, and also how do i help those people who are here on this side who carry all kinds of unresolved grief and other issues around their loved ones who were lost and to me that moment with the mother and the i won't go into too much um it was really important for me to find a place where there was forgiveness and love and um i you know those are just you know maybe it's because i'm you know lived through what i've lived through i just I don't want to re-traumatize our people. It doesn't mean I don't want to do drama. It doesn't mean I don't want to do, you know, the truth. But I just want to find a place not to re-traumatize our people. Is there uh, something that you would like to um, share with all of us about Monkey Beach and um, what it means to you uh, being a director and uh, being out on the forefront with uh, such a uh, inspiring and uh, beautiful indigenous film. Um, well, I, I, I really like to think that we all have that medicine within us. We all, have, we all are storytellers. I think that's the problem I have with this world is this world tries to say this person's a storyteller and that person can't tell a story. And I think that's really wrong. And so it's important for me, in addition to making films, is to try to create that inclusive space where we all have our own place, space mm -hmm. to tell stories. Um, and we may tell it in very di different ways. Um, so I like to think that Monkey Beach is sort of an inspiration to people to think, gee, you know, took her all those years um, there's nothing uniquely special about me. I, you know, I, I um, you know, this, I've, every film I've had to, it's always been a bit of a struggle. It's always been a bit of a challenge in terms of getting it made. Um, I've had many obstacles to overcome. I'm kind of an outsider. I'm not, I've never been um, an insider. And yet I've somehow managed to make the film, make films. And so I think that's, one of the things is, is to, it's this idea of the power of indigenous women to be persistent, to be mm -hmm. resilient and to never give up. I mean, I think that's, you know, one of the things that's really important for me and being able to achieve that. Um, and, and even if other people don't celebrate that with me, I have to let that wash through me. And that's been one of the hardest parts is, you know, thinking, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. Oh, why did I do this? Why did I do that? You know, um, a lot of behind the scene things uh, in terms of the financing and the, that, those partnerships. Um, you know, in the end, I just have to own that ability to make something happen that's beautiful and brings beauty and healing into the world. And that doesn't make me any better or worse than anybody else. It's just that's what I've done and I have to own that. 
and you know the fact that you know film festivals like yours and you know with your, your amazing um, team there with Cheryl sort of leading the team um, knowing that it's being you know recognized and watched and appreciated you know mean, means a lot and I think that builds a community beyond um, the usual communities of where film is you know endorsed or appreciated it kind of just keeps expanding the circle and even beyond that sacred circle of the making of the film, we create a sacred circle around the actual experience of the film as well, once it's on the screen and we're all part of that, you know, and, and um, I think that makes a, a really deep, deep healing. Um, and it's funny when I've read some, there's been some good reviews, not some, been some bad reviews, but there's been some good reviews. And it, one of them recently where this guy kind of got the spiritual dimension of the film and at the moment at which as a filmmaker, it's no longer about you, and but you at the same time are recognizing that there's this messaging going on, this kind of exchange of energy, if you like, between the viewer and the film and the filmmaker that sort of transcends this material world. It's hard to say, hard to express, but it's sort of an interesting thing. And, and um, so the, all those other things fall away because you know that as you know, elders like Leroy Little Bear and people like that, are, you know, those great indigenous minds, you know, great of the mind have said it's all energy. And so in a way, it's so beautiful to be able to be part of that and to help bring that in, in, into being. Well, thank you so much. And it's so important for us to be grateful, uh, grateful for our ancestors and uh, where they where they have brought us today. and. And it's an honor to have you be a part of our festival and, and uh, we wish you the best in your future as a uh, person who is out in front and making a big difference for a native, native indigenous filmmakers, native women indigenous filmmakers. So uh, uh, our hands are up to you, hi Shika. Hi, hi. Thank you so much. I really do value this time with you and appreciate you as a storyteller and hope one day to see your work as well. And thank you so much to the film festival and all the people who are there watching the film or going to watch the film. And um, yeah, and you know, uh, all, you know, respect and love to all the filmmakers, the women filmmakers at this festival. Um, I really do think it's important to honor uh, women as filmmakers. It's, you know, we've still got a long ways to go. Um, as far as being able to have access to, to what we need to tell our stories. So I'm so glad that this festival exists and it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much. Hi, hi. Thank you.